Okay. So uh, let me first of all introduce all our speakers, and then we'll get started here. So we have Chris Sable from Google, we have Javier from Samsung, we have Wei Zhang from Meta, and we have Yang An from Meta. And with that, uh, Chris, you want to uh, take it away here? Thanks, Ross. Yeah. So I guess we'll start with... Uh, Start with an uh, overview of uh, write amplification. So what, what is write amplification? Well, it's the extra writes that are done uh, in addition to the writes requested by the application. Um, so the uh, critical way we define this is the write amplification factor. So that's just the total writes to the media divided by the application writes, the, the data the user actually tried to write. Um, so for an example, let's say the host writes a megabyte, the application writes a megabyte, um, but the device writes two and a half megabytes to the media. Um, that's an additional one and a half megabytes of garbage collected data, um, and so it results in a write amplification factor of uh, two and a half, right? So it's an extra one and a half megabytes of garbage collected reads and then writes. So why is this undesirable? Um, well, it results in overhead, right? Multiple dimensions. So. Um, the extra media reads and writes to do the, the garbage collection can affect performance. Um, it affects the media wear out, right? Those extra writes accelerate the, uh, the aging of the device. And um, those extra writes come with a power cost as well, right? So um, doing the extra writes you know, can blow out the power budget or force you to reduce your uh, performance. Um, so you know, if you have a pure sequential um, write workload, um, just one, one stream of writes, um, you get a WAF of 1.10, you know, right? Whereas if you've got a 20%, um, you know, if you're doing a random write, you get more like a, a write amplification of, of five, right? So this is, um, this, so the big, the big impact is on, is on random write workloads. So how have we kind of dealt with this over time? So back in the early 90s, um, the first uh, big hammer you know, is, is just over-provisioning, right? I, you, you have 20% over-provisioning or you know, even more potentially in some cases, and that, um, that lets you reduce the right amplification. It's sort of diminishing returns though. It's expensive to provision the extra NAND um, and it doesn't solve the problem completely. Um, fast forward to 20, you know, 2007, 2008 timeframe, and uh, trims were introduced. Trims um, let the host say, you know, hey, I'm no longer using this data. So it improves things. It essentially lets you accelerate that, or you know, multiply the benefit of your over provisioning, right? Um, but then, you know, now we move forward to FDP, and the host can provide uh, hints on what data should be placed together. Um, so. I, like I just said, <laughs> host, basically this enables the host to provide a hint on, on, on where to place data via kind of a virtual, like a pointer or a, a pen point. Um, the device is changed to place data into a super block based on that hint. Um, and it advertises the size of the blue, super, that super block to the host. So the host can know when it's, when it's filled up a super block. Um, what doesn't change is the standard NVMe behavior. Reads um, work as they normally do. Writes continue to operate as normal, but there's, with the addition of this optional write pointer handle included. Deallocate and trims operate as they normally do. All security operates like it normally would. So that, that results in um, backward compatibility advantages, right? You can, um, it's, a, it's an opt-in sort of thing. It could be enabled or disabled on a standard NVMe device. Um, you, application isn't, doesn't need to be fully aware of FTP or aware at all to take advantage of some of the benefits. Um, and at, but applications that are aware or made aware over time can take increasing advantage of those, those benefits. Um, did you wanna, yeah. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Uh, a few things. As we all know, it's great to have a standard, but you know, we also need uh, open source code to make this all work. Uh, so. It got, this got ratified in NVMe Express uh, December 2022. Since then, there have been a bunch of open source activities. The Linux kernel has been updated. XMVME has been updated. QMU, FIO, NVMe CLI. And Cachelib is ongoing and very, very close. 
So the FTP ecosystem, as you can see, is ramping up very quickly. And with that, um, let me hand it off to Yong here. Oh, I'm wrong. We'll hand it off to Wei. Okay. Hello. Thanks, Grace, and thanks, Ross. Um, so in the next few slides, um, Yang and I will discuss how uh, Meta uh, can leverage uh, flexible data placement in our data centers in order to uh, better utilize the, the flash resource. Um, like all flash applications, um, at Meta, we optimize for two metrics when we deploy in flash, right? Uh, the first one is performance, and the second one is uh, red amplification, and these two factors actually go hand in hand. And on the other hand, uh, we, the, the scale we are in, um, it actually presents us some opportunities and, and challenges that is different from the other uh, the enterprise applications. And the first and foremost is our scale, right? And any improvements in performance and reduction in red applications uh, will give us a lot of uh, TCO wins. And secondly, um, also because our scale, uh, we need to deploy uh, multiple generations of uh, flash technologies in our data centers. And we also, these technologies are also coming from different vendors. In the, in the world, uh, our deployment is always heterogeneous, right? Um, and because of this heterogeneous, um, um, we actually need to, it's very hard for us to have a uniform data placement strategies on the SSDs. So the ideal case would be uh, we, as the whole site software, work with the SSD uh, to collaborate with them to be able to find the optimized uh, placement uh, uh, policies. And this is why I'm going. And third, um, we also have uh, very diverse workloads, right? So these workloads, um, like listed here, are database, and they can they be coming from containers, and et cetera, and et cetera. And from the SSD's perspective, these are different writers um, to the drive, right? So these writers has uh, very different workload characteristics. And more importantly, these workloads are ever-changing, right? So they're not going to stay still. And even this means even if we learn the workloads today, it's going to change down the road. So if, if you, even if we have a good strategy now, it's not going to work um, possibly like six months from today. And this is, these are the challenges sort of we are facing, right? Um, among all these challenges, um, the, some of the, the fundamental principles in using Flash do not change. And one of the principles is if we can place the user data aligned at uh, super block boundaries, we can always sure that when we erase the data, it's caused minimum red amplifications. And this is the point of view with Meta uh, work with the industry um, to propose FDP. This is the angle where we came from. Um, the other angle um, that we came from is we have diverse software applications. We also want this feature to be backward compatible, as Chris mentioned just now. Like uh, the read commands, write commands, um, mostly stayed intact because when we have this feature, right? When we when the drive has this feature, we don't have to modify a lot on the software applications. To utilize the feature, we can stay word, uh, we can stay backward compatible, and we can also leverage the feature by making minimum changes. And this is the key, I think, um, for hyperscalers, because we have so many applications. And this is also one of the reasons I think for some of the previous NVMe features, the software adoption was the obstacles, and, uh, and FTP definitely makes the software adoptions easier. And this is an early, simple test we run when we try to validate the FTP concept, right? So in this test, there are seven writers. Um, there are these seven writers are writing to the drive, and each of them uh, issuing sequential workloads to the drive. And you would think a sequential workload is actually a very fresh, friendly workload, and it should uh, minimize the write amplification factor. Um, 
but it is not, right? As you can see here, in steady states, uh, in, the, uh, in steady states after, I forgot the, the time here, but um, you can see there is a right amplification factor at two in the IO steady states, right? And uh, you can also see the right throughput degradations uh, as the drive guide into steady states. And why is that, right? And, this is because um, these writers, even though they are sequential to the drive, they are actually uh, very much uh, random, right? Um, it's like the driver is taking seven writers at the same time, and these placements are going to be mixed and interleaved together. And you can see with FDP, the right line here, are going to change the, uh, the performance here. And the seven writers with FDP, they can be each assigned into different super blocks by assigning them to uh, different placement handles or uh, RUH, uh, reclaim unit handles. Um, this way, we can just separate the workloads into multiple uh, super blocks, and each of them own their own uh, area on the drive. And this way, we can minimize uh, the the, relative, uh, the the valve and also maintain the performance as the as the test run. And I'm going to hand over to Yang to discuss some more details on this test. Okay, so uh, I will talk about more evaluation data uh, we had and uh, using FTP. And uh, this one, those ones mostly by simulating the workload and the environment we have uh, currently. And uh, yeah. This one is with the hot cold data mixing. So the, one of the problem is if we have this scale data center and application, some of the, just, uh, just some of the data pattern is hot and it is keep right, it keeps writing data frequently, but most of the data, user data or anything other, uh, those are just call data, it's mostly read only, so we simulated those scenario with the, with the FTP. Uh, by the way, this one, we didn't do anything special to write pattern, so it means that we just r write uh, as it is, we didn't do anything uh, fixed with our implementation, we, it's just a random write or a sequential write. So with the seven writers, five writers were cold and two writers hot. So uh, blue line is showing that standard SSD. So you can see that with that, even with the uh, sequential write pattern with the cold writer, uh, with that hot writer is mixing everything, and uh, you can see that write amplification is over 3.5, about, yeah. And uh, with, the, with the FTP, you can see it is still staying that some of the level between two and one. Uh, it's not one, because we didn't do anything on write pattern, but you can see clearly that FTP still helps. Uh, so we went ahead and implemented the um, friendly write pattern, which is rogue structured write. Uh, so as you probably know, rogue structured write pattern is uh, by far most popular write scheme in a flash friendly file system, or even FTL had a concept from low structure write pattern, low structured file system to minimize write application there. So theory is with the low structure write pattern, uh, device write application should stay at one, uh, but in real situation, because we have multiple application, multiple writers, multiple virtual machine, multiple namespaces, we cannot uh, really control that. So even even if the situation with uh, every, every writers are doing log structure write pattern, uh, we still have write amplification and uh, degraded performance with that. So this diagram shows that, uh, let's say, blue line, it, it is just vanilla. We didn't do anything, and it's just 64, co 64 kilobyte random write pattern. So it's, um, as you expected, it is going above three with the right amplification, and you can see the right throughput is about one third, and um, yeah, that is usual 
pattern we are seeing in data center. So yellow line, let's assume that every application is doing log structure write pattern, but they, are, they don't know each other and they are not cooperating with each other. So with that situation, we still have write amplification over two. So it is not, it helps a little, but it is not helping much with that. So red line, we did the same thing with the uh, FTP drive, a log structure write pattern. Each writer doesn't know each other. And with that, we can stay at write amplification one. And we didn't see any performance drop with that. Um, so in this scale, not every application is going into the same direction. So uh, it's common that we have, we did something. Our, let's say, let's assume our team does something to minimize the write application. But with that server, we cannot control every application, every writer. So let's assume that six writers are FTP friendly by using that log structure write pattern. And one writer is just full random. So it doesn't know, doesn't care anything about write amplification, and it's just final implementation. So even with that, uh, majority of writers FTP friendly, so it can control write position, data placement with that busy random writer, and we can still see that write amplification number one with that. So, uh, FTP is excellent mechanism for host application to improve write amplification and QoS that is important and also performance. And FTP is backward compatible. It, we, we, we use same drive and we just change the write pattern. We experimented with the normal drive and the FTP drive and with the random pattern, uh, it can show a little difference in terms of performance or latency because that is different implementation from the FTL. But we didn't change anything on our side, so we can just use same code, same binary with that. Um, so FTP hints to do not force host to follow strict set of rules. So it means that we can test with a random writer even with the FTP device, it doesn't care if it is. It doesn't know if it is FTP device, but we can still do that and not. So with that, host supporting FTP, meaning that if we implement a uh, flash-friendly write pattern, like logs with write pattern, we can maximize the benefit, but still, even with, without that, our FTP device still have our environment and uh, our QoS, our write application problem. Okay. I will hand it over to Thomas. So I'm going to throw a little bit more data at you on some of the work that we've done with uh, Caslip and RocksDB to show you some real data on how we've used uh, FTP. But before that, I want to emphasize some of the things that Chris mentioned in terms of you know what write amplification means and how we're going to use it for the data I'm going to show you. So. I'm going to use this example of a particular workload where, for this scenario, the uh, deployment needed a write amplification of 1.3. And you know that's just the metric that we're using to talk about the QoS that that particular application or that particular user needs. So we, we can use FTP. You can see 1.3 is not a lot of write amplification. We can reduce it a little bit. Let's say that you can go down to 1.05 or maybe 1.1. You know, the important thing is not that you're reducing the write amplification. The important thing is that if you follow the curve, when are you intercepting the write amplification that you can tolerate for your QoS? And that delta is the OP you're getting back from, from the device, right? Because if you're using some over, you know, the, the usable capacity, the over provision, at the, in this particular example, is at 50%. If you can push it to maybe 70%, 75%, you're getting 50% back of the over provision in that you are doing on your application. Now, I want you to think of that because we hear a lot of people talking about all the technologies that you can use for uh, the, uh, data placement where you get the device uh, over provisioning back. But you need to think of the provision that you might get back on the way you're deploying on your usable data. So 
with this in mind is where we're, you know, the data I'm going to show you is going to be at different capacities, and you're going to see how, you know, how we can gain utilization, maintaining the right amplification at a, at a level that is reasonable for the application. I want to make a, you know, we're going to start with the RoxyB case, then I'm going to go to the uh, to the Gaslib case. These, um, so RoxyB is just a POC at the moment. It's just to show because we had data uh, where we were using a ZNS, and I'm gonna, uh, you know, I want to show this because you can, u we can use things like ZNS that is the we can use it as a metric of your right amplification is one, right? So you can, that can be your ground truth. You can see that the same workload using a standard path through the Linux kernel, uh, we can go to a right amplification that is not quite one, but it's very close to one. Now, the question begs, what's the difference in terms of engineering effort they are willing to put? You can, you can use FTP to gain a little bit of the uh, benefit, you can use FTP to gain a lot of the benefit. The question is where you want to stop. Here, we didn't do much work. And you know, please do not look at these numbers and say, oh, you're getting a 2x. It is very much workload dependent. The important, is the, the important thing is the framework on how you are uh, drawing the benefit that you expect for your application and the engineering effort that you're willing to put into it. Here is Caslib. This is beyond POC. We are working with uh, with Meta in merging this into into AppStream in you know what would be more a production ready uh, scenario. And here you can see how we're moving from 50% to 60, 70, and 80% utilization. Now we have data on other workloads where the write amplification is very very close to one with FDP. But I wanted to show you this data where the where we're not getting to one to emphasize the point that it's not about getting right amplification one because it's very workload dependent. It's about the delta that you're getting and where you're uh, believing that, uh, you know, that the right amplification is acceptable. In this particular case, if you assume the, the scenario I mentioned before where you, uh, when you can tolerate a right amplification of 1.3, you see that you can push it very close to 80% and you would be there Whereas if you push your utilization to 70%, sorry, if you push your utilization around 80%, then you're going a, a little bit above the threshold. And it's all about the optimizations you want to do in the application based on the, on the OP that you want to get back. Uh, I want to emphasize too that uh, while this requires changes to Caslib, so we are, we're tagging the IOs that come, you know, Caslib, without getting too much details, we, we separate a large object and small objects. So we're basically tagging the large objects and tagging the small objects. We're not doing any changes to any of the algorithms. We're not doing any changes to accommodate uh, uh, object sizes to your reclaim unit sizes. That, that's where the complexity of many of these data uh, placement co uh, technologies come into place. We're just tagging very much uh, the right IOs and then letting the drive separate over the lifetime of, of the data. Ross uh, mentioned about the ecosystem. I wanted to emphasize only one part here, and is that uh, typically things that take time in open source is when you start touching a main infrastructure, especially in the Linux kernel. So if we go and do changes to block layer or file systems, that can be a multi-month, uh, potentially multi-year uh, effort. And we are in the process of doing it. However, we worked a lot with the community to enable something that we call a IO pass-through. That is a way in the Linux kernel where you can use directly the NVMe driver from the user space. And then you can adopt technologies like FTP without having to update your kernel, without having to go through upstream process, or if you're a big data center and you're uh, able to put it in, in, your, in your own deployment, you don't need to maintain the code that is uh, off tree. So, FDP relies on this path, so whatever changes that might come into the future into FDP, you will be able to leverage them without having to modify your kernel. And then, you know, you, you can see a list of all the projects that, are, that already have support for it. Ross, you want to do the call for action? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So a couple things. So please share your ideas on workloads with the OCP storage group. And FTP is a great example where of the benefits of collaborating with open source, where you see applications, you see kernel, you see the device, and building great solutions. And with that, um, we have a couple minutes for questions. There's a mic over here and a mic over here. 
Uh, would anybody like to ask our uh, distinguished panel here any questions? So on the metadata that you showed when you showed the separation without, with limited changes to the software, um, did you have to recreate the namespaces such that they were separated out and how did you identify the reclaim unit handles for those? So FTP doesn't need namespace actually, so we can just give a hint when we issue the command. So we changed a little bit on our stack to to give that command and a hint uh, along the way, and uh, just command with that that actually is RU handle in the FTP term. So we just used it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Hello. Is there a uh, software developer's guide somewhere of how a software developer would go implement this uh, from the application side, how to measure WAF, you know, what tools can they use, you know, to comp some of the SSD firmware that supports this? Yeah, so um, if you go to the FIO uh, uh, GitHub repository, we have a few uh, guidelines on, on how to use FTP. And uh, you know how to use a file to do, to to measure FTP. And actually, in the, there is a blog section there where there is also explanation on how to measure WAF and and all those things. So it is very FIO centric because people do not want to go with application specific. But uh, you know, there's also a few. Uh, I think that there's a few companies, including us, uh, doing white papers uh, to explain a little bit more about it. So stay tuned. Let me just add to that. Uh, I think uh, if you want to leverage the feature, fundamentally you're going to use a feature called IO urine NVMe pass-through. Uh, that is allow you to issue commands from uh, user space in Linux, if you're on Linux. Great. Uh, do we want to take one last question and then we'll move to our next topic? It is quiet. Oh, no, we have a question over here. Sure. Uh, outside of the hyperscaler data centers, what do you think the killer apps are that are going to drive adoption of this? I think I saw RocksDB. What else? I mean, well, I can give one. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely, uh, like, uh, virtualization, right? Like, isolation on multiple VMs landing on a, on a given SSD is one big application. Um, I think uh, maybe other people have others here that want to chime in with. Uh, I was going to say, we've been playing around with virtualization and then using things like uh, SRIOV and maybe pass it and other things to do the same thing and we see pretty good results. There's also some going work in putting a, um, a, some of the file systems. Let me talk about Linux, then there's a specific, a specific things like um, ButterFS, maybe things like XFS they have a good streams of data that we can use. However, I want to make a point that while we're doing the work, we're waiting for customers to uh, have an interest in that because we don't want to pollute the, uh, the ecosystem with work that people might not want to. So if you're interested in that, reach out and then we can uh, push the code uh, together upstream. Yeah. So I just want to add that uh, even though we have solution like RocksDB or any, any other open source code that we can benefit from FTP. Uh, if you think about that, RocksDB was designed without FTP and for the people who feel that there is a limitation and there is uh, something that we can do better, uh, FTP is a great tool. So you can implement something from the ground up easily and you can get the benefit from that. Okay, thank you very much. And I think we'll go to our next talk here. <laughs>